This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the State of Michigan, and by viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Eight Weeks of Summer with the Michigan Learning Channel. I'm Tara Hardy. I'm the Director of Education Engagement for the Michigan Learning Channel and for Detroit Public Television. And I'm super excited to join you today with our sixth, sixth week of summer all about the Great Lakes. Today we have special guests with us from the DNR. Um, we will be having jo joining us in just a moment will be Kevin Fraley, who is a expert and education specialist at the DNR. We have Natalie Elkins and Ashley Jackson. In just a moment, we will say hi to them and we will travel across the state of Michigan today to see all of the cool places that you can drive to if you live in Michigan for vacations for these last ounces we can squeeze out of summer. But before we go there, I want to make sure that if you have been joining us or if you have not been joining us, you know that our main spot for this summer for the eight weeks to see what's going on is michiganlearning.org slash summer. Once you go there, you can see all about what's coming up in the next two weeks, and then you'll start to see back to school stuff as we get closer to that. You'll also be able to download this fantastic fun activity book, which our PBS kids featured Marcy says it is great fun. And we this one is for pre-K to second grade. And this one is through third to sixth. If you happen to download the third through sixth today or this week, you will find the DNR has some resource pages in here as well. On page 100 and starting on a page 110, we've got wildlife search and find. We've got Frankenstein with feathers. And then we've got Michigander Fish, where you can do a word search and, and try to have a race who can get the word search done in the family. I, I would tell you that in my family, I would win. My kids would probably disagree. But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to invite Kevin to our screen this morning. Kevin, oh, and we've got Natalie and we've got Ashley. Say hello, everybody. These are some experts from the Department of Natural Resources. Kevin, can you tell me what is the DNR? So we are the folks uh, that work for the state of Michigan that protect and manage all of those wonderful resources that belong to you. So forests, wildlife, fish, parks, all those types of things that belong to the citizens of Michigan, it's our job to protect and keep those enhanced for future generations. Awesome. So what are some of the places that you manage and protect? Uh, most people are really familiar with our state parks and we have wild game areas and other places like that, a lot of public land and acreage. But today we're going to visit a lot of state parks and fish hat a fish hatchery that again belong to the citizens of Michigan and we do some really cool things at these places. Awesome. Where should we start? I think we should go way up north across the bridge to a place called Tequamanon Falls. Awesome. Let's do that. Who do we have there? We're going to meet uh, an interpreter named Teresa Neal. Interpreter? Does that mean she speaks different languages? You know, so a lot of us are familiar with the kind of interpreters we see in a television show, like someone is like might be speaking someone to Russian and they don't know Russian. So there's an interpreter who tells you what they're saying. In our field, in nature, an interpreter tells you what's going on outside and what's going on in nature. So they're a science expert. And so Teresa is that expert, that interpreter, up at Tequamadon Falls. Awesome, let's go to Tequamadon Falls and you get five bonus points if you can say that, Tequamadon Falls <laughs> and <laughs> Teresa. I'm Teresa Neal, park interpreter at Tequamadon Falls State Park. I'm here in the Tequamadon River at the Lower Falls to tell you a little bit about this special place within our park. The Tequamadon River is 94 miles and most of it is pretty slow, except for the parts around the waterfall. So here at the lower falls, there are six cascading waterfalls that make the river speed up quite a bit. And certain animals only live in the fast moving parts of the river. These animals provide the base of the food web that is found here at the park. 
So fish will rely on those little critters. Um, birds rely on eating those critters once they hatch. One of them is the stonefly. Stoneflies, like this, live under the rocks in the Chiquamanon River. They cling and rely on the fast moving current to oxygenate their gills. They'll stay like this in their larval form for a couple years before they crawl out of the river and they hatch into an adult. Fish will eat these guys and as adults, birds rely on eating them too. So stoneflies are an indicator of really clean water because they can only live in really clean, fast moving water. Another animal that lives underneath the rocks, if you were to flip one over, you might find these guys. These are caddisflies. Different caddisflies will build little cases around their bodies to protect themselves from predators. So this species is using tiny pieces of sand and rock to build its protective hull. These guys also live underneath the rocks of Tupamanon. Fish lay their eggs in the rocks of the Tupamanon River in this fast moving part so their eggs can get oxygen. This particular type of caddisfly, instead of using rocks, actually uses little sticks and pieces of leaf and stuff to build its home inside the river on the rocks of the Tupamanon. All of these animals rely on the rocks and the fast flowing river in order to survive. So when people stack rocks for photo opportunities or for something to do, it can really make an impact on these animals' lives. And over time, if all those little insects disappear from our environment, the fish and the birds and the other animals that rely on them might disappear too. So if you ever come visit Tequamanon or any body of water for that matter, feel free to explore, flip over the rocks and see what you can find but please put everything back where you found it, so not to disturb the habitat. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Teresa. That was awesome. Now, Kevin, I think we were at waterfalls there, but we didn't see the waterfalls. Can, do you have photos of the waterfalls? We, we're going to show you some falls right here. So uh, Tequamanon Falls is an amazing place if you've not been there. It is the third largest waterfall east of the Mississippi River. So you've all heard of the Niagara Falls, right? And there's another crazy one. I can't remember the name of in upstate New York, I believe. But Tequamanon is the third largest waterfall by volume. So the amount of water that goes over there every second, um, again, is only second to Niagara Falls and another, another one in New York. So it's an amazing place, 200 feet wide and 50 feet drop. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, I don't know about you at home, but if if you're like me and you have lots of questions, this is a cool opportunity to be able to ask these experts questions about what you're seeing during this time. If you wanna drop those in the chat, we will get to questions at the end of the call today and we'll be able to ask Kevin and all of the DNR folks these questions and get some cool answers. I never even thought to pick up rocks and look underneath them. Now, those falls, can you get closer to those falls? Can you get in those falls? You you will. You can get a, you can get into the river, but most of the road most of the pathways for the for the tourists, it's a really it's one of our busiest parks because of the the amazing falls. And you saw the from those other slides, you saw the amazing different seasons. The falls gorgeous all all year round, but there are these pathways so that you can get up and you can have a nice safe overlook of of the uh, this is of they're looking at the upper falls there's also a lower falls which is where Teresa was they're more of a rapids awesome awesome well i will tell you mind blown over here because i never thought about falls in michigan now i know we've got some other great stuff lined up where are we going next i think we're going to come down state so we're going to go all the way over closer to kalamazoo in the southwest corner of michigan and that's actually Matawan, and we're going to meet uh, Shana Ramsey at our Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery. Fish Hatchery. Awesome. Let's go see what that is. Hi, I'm Shana Ramsey, fisheries interpreter at the Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery. Fish hatcheries are special places. Our main job is to raise fish. 
We care for them and give them everything they need to survive. We give them food, water, shelter, and space. When they're big enough, we release them into Michigan's lakes, rivers, and streams. Michigan's fish hatcheries raise 11 different species of fish. Here at Wolf Lake, we raise four of those species of fish. We raise steelhead trout, Chinook salmon, walleye, and muskie. We raise millions of fish every year, but why do we do it? Fish hatcheries raise fish for three main reasons. First, we want people to catch fish when they go fishing. People that live in Michigan like to fish, and people also come to Michigan from all over the world so they can fish our lakes, rivers, and streams. Fishing is a part of Michigan's heritage, its history, and its economy. Fishing is also just a great way to spend time outside with friends and family. Imagine a great lake, maybe Lake Erie or Lake Michigan. Now picture it without any fish in it. Doesn't sound very healthy, does it? Fish are an important part to healthy lakes, rivers, and streams. And that's just another reason why we raise fish. We also raise some species of fish that need our help. Let's take a look at lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon have lived since dinosaurs roamed the earth millions of years ago. They are the biggest fish found in Michigan and in the Great Lakes. They can weigh 300 pounds, they can grow to be nine feet long, and they can live for 150 years. That's longer than a human can live. Over time, these fish have suffered from habitat loss and overfishing. Fish hatcheries are working hard to help lake sturgeon survive. Did you know that you can visit Michigan's fish hatcheries? You can visit us here at the Wolf Lake Fish Hatcheries. You can feed the fish, walk our nature trails, take a hatchery tour, have a picnic, or just enjoy being outside. Now, let's go feed the fish and see if they're hungry. All right, here we go. Let's see if the fish are hungry. Oh, that is so cool. I, I, oh, my 16 year old daughter loves to fish and she pulls the fish out and she always knows what they are. And I have no idea. I would love to see her pull out a 150 pound sturgeon. <laughs> I think it might break the line. So um, how many hatcheries do we have in Michigan? Oh, we have six uh, that people could go visit. Actually, interestingly enough, during COVID, of course, that many of them were, they were all closed after for a while. But beginning August 1st, which I believe is Sunday, uh, all the hatcheries will be open for, for open visitation. They don't all have a super dynamic interpreter like uh, Shana at Wolf Lake. We only have one of the other hatcheries that has another wonderful interpreter up at Odin, but um, they're all open. You can wander through, you can see the fish in the raceways. You, and, and then some of them, like Shana's case, you can actually feed the fish. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Now I was, I'm still blown away by a 150 year old sturgeon. Are, are fish hatcheries, have they been around for a while since sturgeons can be 150 years old? Well, so so the hatcheries started to come up, come along. We started to build those back when uh, Michigan was a mess. So around 1900, 120 years ago, our state, from a conservation perspective, was a mess. There was a lot of logging going on, as you may call. Michigan was one of the, the logging centers of the of the United States. We cut trees everywhere we could. We really didn't know any better at the time. And all those logs were floated down huge rivers. The Muskegon was, was probably one of the most famous rivers for the logging drives. And so fish in all these Michigan rivers were the, the spawning beds were destroyed by these logs. And so um, our fish began, populations began to really be hurt by this. So we began uh, to build these fish hatcheries around the state and help um, plant fish. Wow. So that's kind of the extreme of why we shouldn't move rocks and, and, and move different habitats so that fish have their place to live. That's interesting. Man, Michigan sure has a ton of treasures. Uh, do we have more places to go? Where should we go next? Yeah, I think we should go back to the UP. So we're going to go so far away. We're going to go to a place called Porcupines Mountains Wilderness State Park. It's over on the Wisconsin border in the Upper Peninsula. And it is 600, just about 600 miles from Detroit. So we're talking, you can get to Chicago in about half the time that it could take you to get to the Porkies. 
We're going to go visit uh, Katie Urban, our interpreter up there. Awesome. Let's do it. Hello, everybody. My name is Katie Urban, and I'm the interpreter here at the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. As you can see, the park is a really big place. In fact, just about as far as you can see is all Porcupine Mountains. We're in fact Michigan's largest state park at nearly 60,000 acres. And we're kind of unique in the fact that we are the only state park in Michigan to have a designated wilderness area. Just about half of the park is designated as a wilderness area. Now, what does that mean? That means that all of this area is protected and tried to kept as wild and natural as possible which means we don't allow things like motorized vehicles, wheeled vehicles, chainsaws, or non-designated camping around in the park, which means you just can't go and camp wherever you want. Now, why do we have all these things here? Why do we have this wilderness designated area? The reason is, is we're trying to keep all of our natural and cultural resources here within the park as safe as possible. Let's take a look at what some of those things could be like. We have things like really cool, unique geological features. An example of one of our cultural sites would be something like here at the old Nunsuch mine, where these buildings behind me are all that's left behind from signs that people used to mine copper here. We also have tons of waterfalls. Lots. And lots. And lots of waterfalls. And we've got miles and miles of pristine Lake Superior shoreline. And not to mention, some pretty spectacular sunsets too. And of course, we can't forget one of my favorite things here at the Porcupine Mountains, which are all of the big hemlock maple forests that make up over half of the Porcupine Mountains itself. These trees are so big that some of them take about two to three people just to get your arms around them. They're massive. So, if you guys find your way all the way up here at the Porcupine Mountains, and we hope that you do someday, that you guys do your part and try to keep that wilderness areas as clean as possible. So if you see any trash on the ground, we just ask that you pick it up and take it with you, even if it's not your own. These are all great practices that you can do, even at some of your own state parks, where closer to where you might be living. I am, I'm so excited. I've never been to the Upper Peninsula. I'm, I'm so wanting to go there now, Kevin. Now- You've never been across the bridge? I, I don't remember doing it. I, I might you would remember if you crossed the bridge, it's magnificent. Yes, so I the only thing I didn't see there were, were porcupines. What Do they have porcupines up there? <laughs> no, so uh, that is originally the, the land was the Ojibwa tribe. And long ago, uh, they thought, you know, the they thought that they looked like a crouching porcupine. And there's that, even a lodge called Kewaju, which is Ojibwe for the crouching porcupine that the um, the park is named after. So what kind of animals would we find up there? So it is really wilderness, of course, most of the upper peninsula is, but, but the porkies, because of its size, like she told you, it's the largest state park. It was almost designated a national park, but that's way too long a story to go into. But that's how magnificent it is. But there's bear, there's wolves, there's uh, occasional cougar wanders through there. So some of the mega a wildlife that you think about in our state, moose, of course, it's all up there in the Porkies. Wow, so so are, would you stay in a tent and be safe? <laughs> a lot of people, it's the famous backpacking park. People come all over the world to backpack there uh, and they put up their tents, of course. But at all of our state parks, you know, we try to make it so that anybody can stay there on their comfort level, right? So a lot of people will bring their campers from the little ones to big RVs. Also, we have a lot of cabins in our state parks you can rent. And in the Porkies and some other ones, you can even get yourself a yurt. A yurt? <laughs> yes. So a yurt is like a, a originates in Mongolia. Uh, and the tribes in Mongolia would use them. They're kind of like a sturdier than a tent, but not as sturdy as a cabin. So they're portable um, and yet and very safe and sturdy. So we have yurts at quite a few places you can rent. They're, they're kind of like just round cabins with tent like sides, but you can see from the pictures, they're, they're really well built and strong. You're not going to get a bear come in there and get you. <laughs> that was my next question was, does a bear stay out of there? 
<laughs> That's no. cool. Um, so do we have any more stops? Yes. Uh, you know, we went as far away as we possibly could in our state. So I thought maybe since you are in the Detroit area, we would come closer to home. We've got a magnificent park, really our third largest state park. Three of our stops were our three largest state parks today by coincidence. But we have a place down there called the Waterloo Recreation Area, which is just on the other side of Ann Arbor. And it's a pretty special place. We're going to meet Katie McGlash in there. Awesome. That is super close to me. Isn't that my, that's by 94 and I know where yeah, that is. Just oh, north cool. of 94. Let, let's go, let's go see. Hi, I'm Katie McGlashan, park interpreter for Waterloo Recreation Area. Waterloo is really close to a lot of the big cities in Michigan. So we're located in between Ann Arbor and Jackson, Michigan, only about an hour away from Detroit. The park is one of the most biologically diverse state parks that we have. So that just means that we have lots of habitats. There are many different species of both plants and animals that live in those habitats. We're actually standing in one habitat. This habitat is called an oak hickory forest. So lots of oak and hickory trees and the nuts and seeds that go with them bring in animals that are interested in eating the seeds and nuts of those big, beautiful trees. We're also overlooking an aquatic habitat. So we have this beautiful kettle lake. A kettle lake is a small lake and it sits low down on the landscape. Um, and here I am in a beach maple forest. So the tree behind me is actually a beech tree. It's got really smooth gray bark and looks a lot like an elephant leg. Uh, beech trees and maple trees, they like to grow in these protected forests. Um, they're protected by hills and also by wetland areas. Bogs are formed from kettle lakes in Michigan. So basically a moss called sphagnum moss grows around the edge of the kettle lake and then over time slowly starts to cover over or carpet the top of the lake. Um, before you know it, you've got a really thick mat of moss um, and that's kind of the beginning of a bog. So the plant or the moss that does that is called sphagnum moss. And sphagnum moss can hold about 40 times its weight in water. So I'm gonna squeeze it out. And you can see it acts as a sponge in this wetland area to absorb all the water and moisture that it's gonna need for the year. So you can see that a bog is a really open environment. It's a wetland type. And so the plants that are out here are used to being in full sun. So they have adaptations that help them deal with all the sunshine and hold on to the water that they need to uh, survive here. In that sphagnum moss, there's a plant growing called a pitcher plant. Pitcher plants are known for being traps for insects. They use the nutrients from the insect um, as plant food. So the pitcher plant has cup-shaped leaves or pitcher, water pitcher-shaped leaves. And when it rains, they fill up with rainwater and then attract insects from nearby. The insects can fly in pretty easily. They climb down inside of this side of the cup and then they get in there and then it's really hard for them to get back out. They get trapped because there's hairs that point downwards and they can't find their way out. They also get trapped because the surface tension on the water is missing. An enzyme in the plant makes that happen. So here's some of the liquid that we found inside of a pitcher plant. In that liquid, you can see there's tiny little larva of probably a mosquito, but also some other decomposing insect parts. With all of its habitats, Waterloo is the perfect park for many plants and animals. They find biological diversity and they've got lots of habitats to choose from. People are the same. We get recreation users in our park for camping, boating, biking, horseback riding, hunting, fishing, you name it. It's a great place. Come visit. Can anyone go to that bog? 
Yeah, you know, if you go to the Eddy Visitor Center, find it on the map when you get there, and that that's where Katie works. And um, there's maps there to tell you how to get down to the bog, and it's it's an amazing hike. There are those beech trees along the side of the the trail that are absolutely enormous, so it's just a beautiful hike. And then when you get there, you get to see all those crazy plants. There's another one there that she didn't show uh, called the sundew, which is another plant that traps insects. Kind of looks more like the famous Venus, you know, fly trap from the cartoons. It kind of has this thing. You can see bugs already caught in there. It's kind of cool. I need some of those plants in my backyard. Do they <laughs> attract mosquitoes too? Uh, mosquitoes are kind of small. I don't know. I've never seen a mosquito in there, but I wouldn't doubt it. They could never trap enough mosquitoes around my house anyway. I know. I would. I might have to try that one. Um, so we've gone to four parks today. Are there more? Yeah, we have like 104 uh, state park and recreation areas in our state. And like I mentioned earlier, we have also state game areas and a lot of other public land, we call it. Michigan's got the second most amount of public land east of the Mississippi River, which is, means that's all of your land, right? So anybody out there that belongs to you and again it's our privilege you know ashley's nally mine and all our all our colleagues at the dnr to protect and enhance and manage all those resources for all of you out there and, and everyone into the future i will tell you i love my job but <laughs> i would love to be outside all the time and i didn't realize that there was so many cool things within driving distance in michigan now so you have jobs that are like you get to be outside are there other cool jobs that kids that our viewers at home um are watching are there jobs that we can be when we grow up i'm, I'm pretending like i'm not grown up yet let's ashley. start with ashley that's what that's one of the reasons we hired her so ashley's gonna uh, try to find a lot of folks uh and help guide them into some dnr positions in the future so we'll let her take that one yeah, absolutely. We want kids to get really excited about the outdoors. We want them to know that if it is an interest of theirs, that there are careers available at the DNR. So those wonderful videos were by interpreters and they get to spend some really great time outdoors. And we have positions like park rangers and conservation officers that spend a lot of their time outdoors. So if kids are interested in that and want to be at the state parks, um, we have some really great roles there. Uh, as you can see also, you know, we have forests and trees that need protecting. They need people to make sure that they're safe and they're thriving. So in our forestries division, we have roles there. You also got to see um, the fisheries division where, you know, we have to make sure that our state's population of fish are thriving. So uh, youth would have opportunities there as they get older if they're interested to work there. Now, I know everyone does not love to be outdoors. So we do have roles um, like my job where you get to connect with the community and tell them about what's going on at our state parks. Also, we have education specialists like Natalie, where you get to teach other people about the great outdoors and about our natural resources. So we do want kids to know as they get older to start thinking about if they're interested. And we'd love to, to tell them more about the roles we have at the DNR. Ooh, so Natalie, I know you're a fellow educator and I think you have a special treat for us. Before we get started with Natalie's special treat for us, um, if you have questions, and I have seen actually quite a bit, so get ready, um, my, my DNR friends. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and keep putting those in the chat. We are going to do an activity real quick before we go to those questions. So Natalie, tell us what we're going to make. Well, when we met Teresa up at Taquamanon, she told us about all the awesome insects that live under the water there, that the birds eat, the fish eat, etc. Those insects that live under the water, when they, ha when they hatch, they live under the water two to three years. Then they leave the water and they have wings and they fly away. So I'd like to challenge everybody to find items around where they're sitting, run outside quick, and we're going to build, engineer an insect. I cheated and because I wanted you guys to have this opportunity to see. Look, Tara's got stuff. I think Ashley and Kevin have stuff. So an insect is made of three main parts, right? Head, thorax, 
abdomen, picture an ant. I think the ant is the best example of this that you, you all have seen and live everywhere, right? So here's what I've done. I've got my abdomen, my thorax, and my head. Rocks I grabbed out of the yard. What else did I grab? Two wings. I mean, that's cool. They look like wings. Antenna, right? Think of an ant again. And how many legs? Six. I just took laid the grass. And when it all comes together, you can see whether you've done it from uh, office objects you've got in your house, like Tara's got in the studio. Kevin's got some stuff. Or you can go outside and scavenge things to make. Look what Ashley's got. That is a, right, a whitener. That's a good body. <laughs> and you end up engineering an insect and remembering that they're very important to our ecosystem because everything needs to eat them at the bottom of the food chain. Um, you said a lot of things we have to remember. While, while kids are still getting their supplies at home, can we put that graphic up again and do the song that you taught me the other day? I think we can sing together. I apologize in advance for sound, sounding like a dying cat, but let's be real. <laughs> we all have our own voices. Let's share together. So read with me. You all know the Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes song. That's the tune we're doing. Ready? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, eyes, six legs, antenna, two. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. I love that because I was thinking about that the other day and I was, I'm like, oh, what do I need for this craft? Which you can do this afterwards if you don't have the stuff. Because I, I think it would be fun to do it outside. But if you're watching us, you're probably not outside. So let, let's go ahead and, and let you continue. Wow. Those are awesome. These are examples of one of the summer camps we run for teachers for professional development, learning to teach this to early learners. So it's these kiddos and they do it in their classrooms, preschool and young fives. Oh, yours turned out great. Look at the paperclip legs. I uh, awesome. So, oh, I was like, when I was singing that song, I was thinking, oh no, I forgot antenna, antennae. How do you say plural, antennae? Antenna, antenna. 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 I have them built in on my clip. Mm -hmm. So here's my oh. head. Thorax is a little guy. And then my, bo my body, abdomen. And then my legs and my antenna. I don't have any eyes, but I might later try to find little things for eyes. I can creatively say these are kind of the eyes. I think it works. It works for me. Works. What, what do you guys have? Mine's dilapidated. I have a pair with one antenna. So something ate it off. <laughs> Whoa. And then I found this uh, small chestnut just beginning to fall off a tree, American chestnut. And then I have a long, really long abdomen here. The I can't get that Kevin the camera. Cord you color coordinated though. I'm very impressed. Yeah. And then I, got, I found a bunch of seed pods for legs. Oh. And then a couple more leaves for wings. I bet that would be cool if you took like a piece of paper and glued it on the paper, you would have it so you could put yeah, it on. I'm going to eat the pear. I think the pear might smell bad after a while though. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So let's go ahead to the, co the comments and the questions because I know our viewers are watching and hopefully as excited as I am to find all these cool treasures in Michigan. One of the questions we have is, why are the falls at Taquamanon a different color? So that is tannic acid. So that whole area has this tannic acid that comes from the trees. And so it turns the water a dark color. It's not harmful at all. It's just the color. Oh, yeah. Because weren't, cool. those, weren't those bugs that she was talking about there because the water was clean? Yes. Okay. You can find those same bugs, though, I mean, anywhere. You can find them in the closest river to you, most likely, again, but they are a good indication of clean water. The more bug, the more bugs, the more clean water. I'm, I'm down for clean water, <laughs> as I am down for yurts that keep bears out. So let's look. Oh, we got another one. How old are the hemlock trees at the Porcupine Mountains? Old. Yeah. <laughs> are they really, old really old? Virgin? I I don't know, Natalie. You know, I don't remember their age, but they're they're you know, so they're considered virgin trees. So they some of those trees have never been cut. Wow. Um, at one time, they were going to log the whole area off. 
it was the slopes were too steep. And again, remember it was going to be protected. It almost became a national park I mentioned. And so many of the trees in that park have never been cut. So, wow. There yeah. are cedar trees the on the escarpment, cedar trees on the escarpment that are only about this big around that are hundreds of years old because they oh, fought for their resources. Older. Nope. Interesting. And that's a cool thing to know. Yeah. Um, and actually, why we're asking these questions, I, you guys have a website where if people couldn't get their questions in today or if they have further questions or want to know more, like, for example, my 16-year-old daughter might catch a fish and want to see what kind it is, where where should folks go to find that information? So, so we run a page where we post every day with cool nature tips, Great Lakes stuff, Michigan-centric. It could be rocks. It could be trees. It could be wildlife. It could be fish called My Nature. Uh, and right here, facebook.com, my nature DNR. Every day we post, and I personally answer the questions. So ask, and if I don't know, guess what I do? Go ask another expert who does know. So connect with us there. Yeah, well, and, and real scientists don't always know the answers, but they try to find them, right? We talked about that in our, our uh, Tuesday event. So, um, all right, we've got, I live in Detroit. What is the closest park to me? I know Ashley. the answer to that, I think. Yeah. Well, I live in Detroit, too. So um, <laughs> my favorite park and the closest park is going to be Belle Isle Park. So it is um, actually an island, and it's beautiful. There are so many activities there, um, biking, fishing, kayaking. Um, so I would totally recommend Belle Isle Park if you live in and around Detroit. I absolutely love Belle Isle Park. They, you, could do, you could be there for a whole day and yes. not run out of things to do. Um, all right, how do we get our children and grandchildren involved? Kevin or me, you choose. Well, we'll both take that one, Natalie. I'll just start by saying, um, you know, I don't wanna belabor this, but there's been study after study done now that we as a species are connected to the outdoors. We belong outside. And so every generation, we tend to slip a little bit more inside and better, it's better for us mentally, physically, emotionally to spend more time outside. And I'll let Natalie take the second part, how we do it. <laughs> My second part is things like we're doing today, sharing four resources nobody's been to and didn't know existed. Just sharing that. There's a reason Ashley, Kevin, and I have a job at the DNR. We think it's important to share what we have and let the citizens of Michigan who own the public lands know they're there and how they can use them and respect them. So yeah. that my nature page, that my nature page. It would be cool to as a as a grandma or a mother. That's because I'm, I'm not a grandma, but <laughs> God, I hope I'm not a grandma. But um, <laughs> excuse me, going to that page with your child would be a really cool thing to do and to look at it together and have your child help to decide where they what interests them and where they might want to go. I think that would be cool. And going back to the mental health piece. Absolutely, 100%. When I'm having a bad day or I'm frustrated or I'm sad, I find water. And I just go and I kayak on it or I sit by it or water is my uh, my my artery for, for mental health, for sure. There um, is one more piece I do want to make sure I bring okay. up for the grandma out there that's looking. We have a website we put together right when COVID hit because we had teachers and homeschool parents asking us. How do we entertain our children? You know, and get them outside at the same time. And it's called Nature at Home. And it's got apps, videos that are interpreters, like you met today, uh, have 130 or so. I mean, lots. Uh, cool things to do on your phone, bingo in your backyard, lessons, resources like books and field guides. It's all there. One stop shopping. Check it out. Awesome. Yeah, I remember when my kids were little, they're teenagers now, but I remember they weren't always excited for me to take them places and go outdoors. But once they were there, yep. mm -hmm. they loved it. It was just so I, I encourage grandparents and parents, if your kids are saying, no, I don't want to go there, especially if they're teenagers like mine, do it anyway, because <laughs> once they're there, they'll start to learn. And if they see you enjoying yourself out in nature, they will learn how to do it themselves. Now we've got some more questions. How does an area become a state or national park? Ooh. Well, you know, it's not obviously so much today. Um, there are still, we just got a new state park, Natalie, what, about two years ago yep. down near Jackson. Um, but it's rare because of course land is so hard to come by and, 
and all of that. But years ago, when you know, 19, early 1900s, even late 1800s, Yellowstone was the first national park, 1872. Um, people just had the wherewithal at that time to realize these special places. And most of our parks, let's face it, were set aside years ago because they were really special, like you saw today. Incredible rocks, formations, wildlife, waterfalls. That's why the original places were all set apart, whether they're state, um, and every state has state parks or national parks. Um, but there's a lot, the back at the time, there was a long process to get it through the legislature and get the land purchased and everything like that. So it's, it, you know, but again, you know, Mackinac Island, here's trivia for you. If I get this right, was the second national park after Yellowstone. Oh. And then they changed changed it and there was some different ownership and they gave it back to the state. So it was really never labeled a national park. It was like in the process of becoming the second national park. Um, so, you know, Michigan's got some really cool special places. That's very cool. Now, I, I think we might have answered this, but I don't remember the answer. So where can I see where all the state parks are? Oh, you're going to visit our website. You, if you visit our website, Kyle's got it to throw up there, um, michigan.gov slash DNR, and you just Google parks or forests or wildlife areas, and bam, it brings you to a page that maps it out for you. You can find one by how close it is or by one that's really far away that you want to go check out. Fantastic. Now, I know, I, I think we're going to wrap up now because we've, st if people still have more questions, absolutely reach out to this fantastic team. And in at the end here, after I say my goodbyes, we're going to put a, a screen, a screen up on the page, a page up on the screen. That's how you know it's time to end a call for Tara is when she can't talk anymore. Um, that'll give you some go-to spots. Also, the um, email address for this great team is my project. Am I like Michigan? If you do am I for this team, you're you're ninety-nine percent going to get it right. Project wild at gmail.com. Thank you to the fantastic team for joining us today. This has been so enlightening and so fun. Um, those of you at home, thank you for tuning in. We would love to have you join us next week for week seven of, of eight weeks of summer. Next week, we will be going around the world for the week. Uh, Michigan Learning Channel will have programming that matches that. The um, Tuesday, our virtual event will be with the Curious Crew on making crayon candles. I've melted crayons before, and, and I'm curious to see what the Curious Crew does. Um, and then if you are near the Detroit metro area or want to travel to get there, we will be Wednesday in the parking lot um, on of St. Anselm, which is on 17700 West Outer Drive. We will be there with these workbooks printed out, handing them out for free. And we'll also be giving some cool things to do outside like bubbles and sidewalk chalk. And and my team will be there dancing with music. And um, it's a fun time. If you get a chance, we'll be there from 10 to 12 on Wednesday. And then Thursday, speaking of the Upper Peninsula, we have met a cool guy named Mr. Jim, who is up north at the in the UP at a children's museum who is going to take us around the world in the plane that is there and show us lots of creatures. So tune in and thank you for being here today. We're going to say goodbye and pop up that, that contact information on the screen of where you can go to find great stuff. Thank you. See you soon.